Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. I'm glad that you are here today as we continue with our sermon series that we're calling Breathing Room. It's all about uh, hitting the pause button here at the beginning of a new year and taking stock of our lives and asking ourselves, what is the quality of my life and what do I need to do from a biblical perspective to create some breathing room to begin to infuse my life with those biblical principles that will help me begin to experience life the way God intended for me to experience. What Jesus called the abundant life or the full life. Breathing room is not just about calendars and schedules. It's not just about having margin. It's about any number of aspects of life. And today we're going to consider uh, another component of uh, a, a, a full life, biblical community. What does it mean to have community? And how can that impact our lives in such a way that we have adequate breathing room to enjoy and experience life the way that God intended. But before we jump into that, let's take a minute and pray together. Father, we are grateful today for the privilege and the opportunity that is ours to gather here in your house to lift up the name of your son Jesus, to worship him and to praise him and to experience the power of your Holy Spirit as he empowers and enables us to worship you and to experience fellowship and connection with you and with one another. Thank you for that blessing. Thank you for the gift of your word, for its power and its truth and its ability to speak into our lives. As we turn to it now, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and guide us into all truth. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen. One of the unique privileges of being a pastor is the opportunity that I have to regularly journey with people through the significant moments and seasons of their lives. For close to 23 years now, It's been a blessing beyond words for me to come alongside folks and celebrate with them in some of the happiest occasions of life. I've been able to uh, preside at hundreds, literally hundreds of weddings. I've been able to baptize infants, lead people to Christ, celebrate with people at milestone anniversaries, uh, pray with people at the launch of new businesses, all sorts of opportunities to come together with people and just say, thank you, God, yay, God, for the amazing blessings that you are pouring out on us. I often pinch myself still, just cannot believe that I get to do this. It's, it's a wonderful aspect of pastoring that I'm very thankful for. And of course, there's the other side of pastoring as well, the, the sacred duty, the sacred privilege that pastors have to journey with people through the difficult seasons of life. Getting that phone call that no one wants to get in the middle of the night and racing to the hospital to be with a family in the emergency room, to be with a family in the waiting room. I've been privileged to conduct funerals and to walk with families as they grieve and say goodbye to someone that they loved very much. It's it's all part and parcel of being a pastor and something that I will never take for granted. As I have made this journey with countless families and individuals, I've noticed that there is a principle at work in all of the significant moments of our lives. In the happy occasions, if we are surrounded by biblical community, if we have 
friends who genuinely love us, care about us, are invested in our lives and mean something to us, in the happy times, somehow, some way, the happiness is exponentially increased. There's just something about sharing the joyful moments of our lives with others that makes the joy even greater. And likewise, if we have those friends and we have that community, when we move through the difficult seasons, the tough seasons, the hard times, somehow, some way, the pain and the difficulty is diminished doesn't necessarily go away. And sure, there are still things that we as individuals have to work on, but there's just something about being in community that increases joy and diminishes the pain. That's why we invite people to weddings, because it's fun to celebrate this wonderful event with our community, with our friends. It makes it all the more fun. That's why we have funerals, because we need people in our lives to journey with us when we're going through those difficult days. Community increases joy and somehow diminishes the pain. Community provides that breathing room that we all need to experience both the good and the bad in the best possible way. I've also noticed, though, that the converse of this principle is true as well. If we do not have significant community, if we don't have close friends, if we don't have meaningful relationships, the fun times aren't as fun, and the happy times aren't as happy. What if you threw a party and nobody came? It's no fun to celebrate alone. And I think it probably goes without saying that one of the worst things that can befall a person is to have to suffer alone, to move through a difficult season with no one to reach out to, with no one to help us shoulder the burden of whatever it is that we're moving through. I think perhaps the saddest funeral I have ever conducted was some years ago, back when we were still living in Atlanta, Georgia. I got a phone call from the funeral home one afternoon telling me that uh, an elderly woman in the community had passed away. She was not part of a a church, uh, but they they needed a preacher. Would I be willing to do it? So I agreed that I would. And on the day of the funeral, the only people who were present were this woman's daughter and son-in-law and me. Three people in a cavernous chapel to conduct a funeral. I thought to myself, how incredibly sad. I mean, it's, it's hard enough losing your mama. But then to have to go through that experience by yourself, devastating, I am sure. Can't imagine how difficult it was for that woman and her husband to go through that experience alone. Here's what I know about you and me. We were created for community. From the very beginning, it has been God's intention that we live in the context of, in the midst of, meaningful, life-changing, biblical community. Community that breathes life into us, that provides breathing room for us. Do you realize that the very first observation that God ever made about humanity. The first thing that he specifically said about humanity is found in Genesis chapter 2. He said of Adam, it is not good for man to be alone. From the very beginning, God understood aloneness is not the best. It's not even good. And when God decided to become a human being himself, when he took on flesh, he didn't arrive in some you know, bizarre, fantastical manner, appearing out of nowhere. No, God came into the world just like all the rest of us do as a little baby into that basic unit of community called a family. And that baby grew up in the context of family and neighbors and understood what it was like, the good and the bad, of what it means to be a part 
of a community. And when that little baby grew up to become a man and launched his public ministry, one of the first things that Jesus did was to call to himself 12 friends. He didn't venture out into ministry alone. Even though he was the son of God, he called to himself friends, and they journeyed with him for three years all the way to the cross and beyond. No question about it. You and I were made for community. It is God's intention that we live that way. And few things in this life can provide breathing room, quality of life for us, like a biblical community, a community that reflects God's values and the values of his word. I want us to look at a passage from the New Testament that's found in the Gospel of Mark. If you need a Bible, raise your hands. Uh, The ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. Mark chapter 2. Mark is the second book in the New Testament. This is a a familiar story, one that uh, perhaps many of you have heard before. However, typically, it is not a passage that is necessarily associated with the value of community. There, There are many important truths in this story. And community is certainly one of them, but it's not one that is usually thought of right off the bat as one reads this story. But I believe by the time we're done today, you'll see that it really does a powerful job of teaching us how vital community is to our lives and certainly to our walk with Christ. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, The people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, "'Son, your sins are forgiven.'" Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. I am indebted to John Ortberg for helping me to see two very important characteristics of biblical community. This story teaches, among other things, that community as God intended, relationships that lead us to a place of breathing room, have at least two very important attributes. And for the remainder of our time, I I want us to consider those. And the first is that members of biblical life-giving community prioritize serving one another. They prioritize serving one another. It's not about me and my needs and my wants. It's not about us. No, members of this kind of community are on the lookout for one another. They understand they have a responsibility to each other. They count it a privilege to be able to serve and care for and love one another. If you think about it, it is a marvel that the man in this story had any community at all. Everything was stacked against him with regard to forming community. Certainly, culturally, it would have been very difficult for him to have had any friends because in that culture, in that day and time, a catastrophic illness was typically viewed as a judgment from God. It wasn't just an unfortunate occurrence in someone's life. No, if you were a paralytic, if you were a leper, 
if something was seriously wrong with you physically, most folks backed away and immediately understood, I wonder what in the world he did. I wonder what his family may have done. Surely God's judgment rests upon this person. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in that situation. And so to avoid guilt by association, or worse yet, to avoid perhaps judgment falling on themselves, people tended to give the sick a wide berth and stayed far, far away from them. And so it says something about the character of these men who drew near to this guy, that in spite of the cultural norms, they would not be stopped They were willing to enter into fellowship, into community. They were willing to serve this man. It's no less a marvel the man had fellowship when you consider not just the cultural uh, difficulties, but the physical difficulties involved as well. I mean, how in the world was he going to get out to make any friends? He was a prisoner in his own home, a prisoner on that mat. How was he going to get out and find friends in the first place? But somehow they found him. Somehow these fellows took the initiative to enter into fellowship, to enter into friendship, despite the difficulties associated with that kind of friendship. If they were going to get together, inevitably it was going to have to be at his place, such as it was, or they were going to have to carry him wherever they were going to gather as a group. And if food were a part of the gathering, someone was going to have to feed him. And if he had an accident, someone was going to have to clean him. Not things that people were too particularly excited about then and now when it comes to being in relationship with others. And yet, these guys would not be stopped. They were simply amazing. They were not going to let anything get in the way of being able to serve this man and to provide him with what he needed. They were willing to do whatever had to be done to make sure that this man was served and able to experience life-giving community. Last summer, uh, a couple moved to this area from the north, and they were at a new season in their lives. Empty nesters, new job opportunity, came down here to live, looking forward to what God had for them. And so they were looking for a church and came to visit Faith Bridge one Sunday. And while they were here, they learned about our grow group ministry and the opportunities that we have for people to be in community right here at Faith Bridge. So they thought, well, we need some friends. Let's go find some. So they went to visit a grow group and had a good experience, enjoyed it. Shortly after their first visit, he had a heart attack. Now, I'm sure it was tough enough just being in a new town and not knowing where things are. And being away from all that was familiar and being away from friends and family. Uh, But then to have a heart attack on top of that, it must have been a terrifying experience for them. But in that moment, they experienced, they were the recipients of biblical community. Because this Faith Bridge Grow Group kicked into high gear and began to pour out the love and the kindness and the service and everything that this couple needed to make it through those difficult days. They provided transportation and food and love and prayers and visitation and all of the things that this husband and wife needed to get through that. I was talking to the the group leader just last week, and even though it's been about seven or eight months now, and and he's all better and, and doing well. Still, when they get together as a group, this man walks in, and the first thing he always says is, you people are unbelievable. You people are amazing. You didn't even know us. We just showed up the one time in your group, and here you have loved us and cared for us. I would not be here if it were not for the love and kindness that you had shown. So what about you? Do you have that kind of community in your life? If, if you or your family were to move 
through some sort of difficult season? Do you have the people around you who could move in close and love and care for you and extend to you the things that you would need, serve you in the way that you would need to make it through that? Do you have the capacity to offer that to someone else? Biblical community prioritizes serving one another. It's all a part of being the body of Christ. It's all about reflecting the spirit of Christ. Just as he gave himself up to serve us, we enter into community that we might serve one another. Another characteristic of life-giving community is that it always draws us closer to Jesus. It always draws us closer to Jesus. If you think about it, the fact is this man never would have met Jesus, never would have laid eyes on Jesus had it not been for his friends. He was a prisoner in his home. He had absolutely no way of getting himself to Jesus. Never mind the crowds. He was physically incapable. I don't know if you've ever had occasion to help carrying an adult human being, but it is an incredibly difficult thing to do. It is awkward. It doesn't lend itself to being an easy task. And while the text does not tell us if they carried him just next door or if they carried him clear across town, whatever the case, they did what they had to do to get this man to the feet of Jesus, even including tearing a hole in somebody else's roof. Can you imagine what the meeting with the insurance adjuster was like after that episode? Yeah, these guys, they just sort of did this. And in verse 5, Jesus says the most astounding thing. Picture the scene in your mind. There's a group of people jammed into this house, listening to Jesus teach, and suddenly folks begin to notice there's like plaster and straw and stuff, and it, it, Look up and there's this increasing hole over their heads and, oh my gosh, is that, yes, that's somebody coming down. And the passage tells us, because of their faith, Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven. He didn't say, son, because of your faith. No, the combined faith of the friends and the man led to the man's salvation. The fact is, none of us come to Jesus alone. Any of us who name the name of Jesus as our Lord and Savior arrived in the context of community. Others helped bring us along. And if you stop and think about it long enough, you can look over your shoulder and see, oh yeah, all kind of people were responsible for bringing me to Jesus. Maybe it was mom and dad, or other relatives, neighbors, friends, teachers, coaches, youth leaders, pastors, God has a way of assembling people in our lives who pour into us, who love us, who pray for us, who encourage us. And it's in the midst of loving community that we find ourselves at the feet of Jesus. We don't land there alone. And a biblical community is designed not only to serve one another, but to continually bring each other to the feet of Jesus to receive whatever it is that we need from him. And not only do we come to know Jesus in the midst of community, we maintain our relationship with him in the midst of community. The most dangerous thing in the world for a Christian to do is to try to go it alone. It's hard to be a believer. It takes devotion, discipline, commitment. And we need people around us to hold us in there to encourage us and teach us, to rebuke us and to forgive us, to remind us why we started doing this in the first place, to keep at it until the day comes that either the Lord returns or we go to see Him. We need each other desperately because everything about life is designed to push us away from Jesus. 
There's nothing about the world at large that is conducive to serving and loving and following Jesus. Everything about the world tells us it's a waste of time, it's a fairy tale, it's a myth. Go on and do what you want to do. And completely apart from an inhospitable environment, we have an enemy. The Scripture says that he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The worst thing that any of us can do is try to step out there alone and live for Jesus. Some of you may have seen last week the story about the former NFL player who somehow or another fell off of his fishing boat in the middle of the ocean and was stranded out there for hours on end. And as I listened to his story, I thought to myself, that situation is a perfect picture of a Christian trying to go solo. There's nothing hospitable about the ocean for human beings. It's all working against us. The water is salty. There are waves designed to overwhelm and drown us. There's wind. There's exposure. It's cold at night. The sun burns us during the day. Nothing about being in the middle of the ocean by ourselves lends itself to life. Not to mention, apart from the environment, there are enemies out there who would like nothing more than to devour us. God designed you and me to be in community, not only to come to the feet of Jesus, but to stay at the feet of Jesus and to make our journey with the love and support of others. That video testimony there was so powerful in part because it pointed out how much that young man needed people, not only to bring him the first time, but then to draw him back the next time and to hold him in there And lest any of us think that we're going to reach a place of maturity or understanding or age or knowledge that we don't need it anymore, don't be fooled, friends. Community is something we need to the very end. What about you? Do you have a group of people in your life who love you enough to keep pushing you toward Jesus? who are there to encourage you when you need that, to rebuke you when you need that, to forgive you when you need that, to teach you when you need that. We all need that presence in our lives of other people that we know that we know that we know love us and their only motive and their only desire is to push us and to point us in the direction of Jesus. One of my uh, pastoring, preaching heroes is a fellow up in Chicago by the name of Bill Hybels. And Bill has articulated a, a spiritual principle that I think sums up very well what I'm trying to say here about the importance of, of godly community, godly friends. You might want to write this down because it's definitely worth remembering. It goes like this, stupid rubs off. Stupid rubs off. I remember when I first became a Christ follower, I I was the only one in my group of friends who had made that decision to follow Jesus. And in my uh, immaturity and naivete, I honestly thought that I could be the one who, who pulled the rest of them up. But the reality was they were just pulling me down. And I am so grateful that an older, wiser, godly man came alongside me and said, look, Dan, I know you love your friends, and and I'm not asking you to give up your friends, but you need to have new friends as well. You need to have people who've walked with Jesus, who can help you grow up, who can help you become strong, so that your witness is more consistent and more powerful And so that you are not so easily drawn back into the things that you are desperately trying to get away from. I'm grateful for that friend. I'm grateful for the grace of God that I was able to receive what he was saying to me. And so I began to invest heavily time and energy into a community that wanted to draw me closer to Jesus. I didn't give up my old friends. I mean, not for a minute am I suggesting that we shouldn't have non-Christian friends. That's what we're all about, introducing other people 
to Jesus. But they can't be the source of our sustenance. They certainly can't be the only source of community that we have in life. Otherwise, we'll be pulled back in the other direction. That's been a long, long time ago, and it's been my uh, good fortune, tremendous blessing, that with time and with growth and maturity, God was able to use me to lead two of those to Him. But that never would have happened if I had not, first of all, placed myself in a community of people who were bringing me to Jesus. Do you have that in your life? Do you have people around you who are helping you become more like Jesus every day? As I read this story, I began to think about this man and his experience on a daily basis. What must it have been like to live life as he knew it? How many times did he have to resign himself to his fate? I I would have to think that someone who suffered with paralysis goes through uh, a resolve and acceptance over and over and over. I seriously doubt there's just the one time that you say to yourself, well, this is it. No, I imagine every day of his life, he probably in some small way had to accept, here it is. Lying there on that mat in his home, uh, I wondered about nighttime. You know, everything's so much bigger and scarier and badder at night. How many times did he lie there thinking to himself, why me? Why did this have to happen to me? What, What could my life have been like if I weren't paralyzed? What would my life be like if I were free from this prison that I call my mat. Little did he know that one day four friends would come along and make up a community, a fellowship that loved him so much they would do whatever they had to do to serve him and to bring him to the feet of Jesus. And that in the presence of a loving Savior, he would be able to take that prison he had known for so long and with hands that actually worked, roll it up. And with feet and legs that actually moved, he'd tuck it under his arm and walk right out of there, healed and whole. That's what community in the context of a relationship with Jesus can do for each one of us. Because here's the fact of the matter, friends. Every one of us have a mat. Well, maybe we're not paralyzed physically. But we've all got something in our lives that holds us back, that imprisons us, that keeps us from becoming the man, the woman, the boy, the girl that God created us to be. And I imagine there are as many mats as there are people here today. When the service is over in the atrium of Center Court East, our grow groups are going to be stationed out there for what we call a meet and greet An opportunity for everyone to go out and learn what community is like here at Faith Bridge. And if you're not presently in a group, if you don't have the kind of community that we've been talking about here today, please make your way to the atrium. Talk to somebody. Find out. When do they meet? What are they talking about? Might this be a place for me and for my family to begin to experience the life-giving, breathing room community that God wants to have for each one of us. Maybe you'd say to me, you know, Pastor Dan, I, I tried that once before and it didn't just, didn't just click for me. It didn't work out. Well, try it again. Maybe you were at a point in your life back then where either you weren't ready 
or in a group was not available to meet your needs. But don't write the whole thing off. Give God another chance and look for that opportunity to find a group of people who will serve you and who you can serve, who will draw you and who you can help draw closer to Jesus. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for creating us in such a way that we can experience and enjoy each other. Thank you for giving us the faculties necessary to relate, to converse, to love, to serve, to be a part of one another's lives in a meaningful, life-changing way. I pray for all of my brothers and sisters here that in the coming days, perhaps even beginning today, you would continue to reveal to us and prompt us to move toward this gift. And I pray for anyone here who currently does not have it, that you would open doors, create possibilities, so that each one of us could know the fullness of what it means to be in the body of Christ. And we offer our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript from FaithBridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi, and thanks for joining us for another Postscript. My name is Justin Teague. I'm the worship and communications pastor here, and I'm with Dan Slagle, uh, who just finished preaching part three of our New Year series called breathing room. Thanks for being here, Dan. Yeah. I'm actually going to go right into it. Uh, one of our postcard questions that came in uh, while you were preaching during the nine o'clock sermon question was, what would your encouragement be for someone who has been in community before, but has been wronged or deeply hurt and are now skeptical to try it again? Sure. Well, the, the short answer and then the longer answer. Uh, my encouragement would be try it again. Uh, here's why. I think we always need to remember that because we live in a broken world composed of sinful human beings, the possibility is ever present for uh, confusion, misunderstanding, hurt feelings. That, that sort of goes along with life. Mm -hmm. But that does not in and of itself cancel out the value of good community, nor the imperative that I think we find in God's Word to, to be in that community. I mean, there, there is not any reference in Scripture to be in community unless it goes south. Uh, that, that sort of escape hatch isn't there. Uh, a, a possible analogy would be, uh, I remember as a kid very well, the first time that I had to take penicillin, it was in liquid form. It was horrible. <laughs> it was awful. Uh, but I'm so glad that my mother persisted and made me take the penicillin. In a similar way, uh, community is a vital for our spiritual health. and. If you've had a bad experience, my heart goes out to you. I've been a part of groups that didn't go so well myself. But let's not use that as an opportunity to miss out on uh, the good that can come from these and walk in obedience to what I think Scripture clearly teaches we should make a priority in our lives. That's good. And right there along the, the series, uh, theme of breathing room. I think so many of us, me included, can go into these situations kicking and screaming. And then once you're there, you go, wow, yeah, this, this really, how did I live without this? Sure. So a couple of bad experiences shouldn't dissuade you from doing that. Exactly. I think that, that's probably what Luann would say if she were here. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, speaking of breathing room, mm -hmm. uh, where are we headed now? What we, 
give us a little recap of where we've been and where, where we're headed. Okay, so Ken got us off to a great start talking about the importance of the, uh, the vertical relationship, our relationship with God and cultivating that. Uh, then we talked about the relationship we have with material things, specifically money, and how a right relationship there can create breathing room. Today I talked about the horizontal relationship with, with other people and how that's an important component. Uh, next week we're going to talk about developing uh, a posture and attitude of, of gratitude and how that perspective can go a long way toward helping us enjoy a quality of life that ungrateful people never ever get to experience. So that, that's up for next Sunday. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Me too. And thanks for joining us for another Postscript. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.